think I'm recording. My wife usually does this for me. Again, I gotta say good morning and welcome to Harvest Church and especially to those who are watching online. Now they're watching me from the side. Sorry about that. Anyway, uh, last week we started in a new verse-by-verse study of the Gospel of John. And if you weren't here last week, I would suggest, I mean, it's just a suggestion, for you to get a real good understanding of where we're, where we're going in the Gospel of John and kind of the background of the Gospel of John, uh, you can go back and you can go online either on Facebook or YouTube. You can look at, you can look at the last week's message. Uh, I'm going to review some of that information today. Of course, I always do that to, to just keep it in its context, but, but you don't want to miss the introduction if you, if you don't have to. Uh, so there's lots of material that's in one verse, just tons. So let's continue on our study of the Gospel of John. If you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me to the Gospel of John, we're going to be in the first chapter. It's the fourth book in your New Testament. It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Uh, and our scripture this morning is found in chapter 1. And once again, we're going to be reading the first five verses because we're going to actually make it through the first five verses today. How do you like that? Uh, but before we do, remember, nothing good happens without prayer. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just pray that you would just, uh, that you would, you would open our eyes and ears to hear from you today. Uh, Lord, we thank you for this ability to be here today and so many other places in this world we don't have that ability and, and, and so Lord, we're thankful that we're able to, to gather and study your word and, and learn more about, about your, your love for us. And so Lord, we thank you. We praise you for what you're going to do. Lord, let it be your words and not mine. I just pray that you would just speak through this vessel uh, and Lord, that you would, you would receive glory for everything that we do today and we just pray all of this in Jesus precious name amen okay look at verse 1 John writes no this is powerful stuff too in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God he was in the beginning with God all things were made through him and without him was not anything that anything made that was made in him was life and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now, I told you last week where we're going, so today I'm going to tell you where we're going today. First, we're going to review the points that I made last week so that we can keep this all in its context. Uh, and then we're going to pick up in verse 2 where we left off last week. So, last week I started off and I gave you a bunch of that gospel distinctives, if you remember, if you remember right. I'm just going to touch... We, we said that John is one of the four Gospels, and there's four different viewpoints, and there's, there's four different purposes for each, each account, right? So let's just quickly revisit, re revisit these. Matthew's Gospel, when he wrote it, he portrayed Jesus Christ as the Messiah of Israel, the, the King of the Jews. And Matthew's message to the world was, Behold your King. Mark's Gospel portrays the Lord as a suffering servant. So Mark's message to the world is, Behold your servant. Luke's gospel portrays Christ as the Son of Man, and he emphasizes the humanity of Christ. And Luke presents Christ as the perfect man walking among all of us, right? So uh, Luke's message is, Behold the man. God-man, of course, but behold the man. So the first three Gospels, what we call the Synoptic Gospels, they describe the events in the life of the Lord Jesus Christ from different viewpoints, and they're actually targeted towards different audiences. But then when we come to the Gospel of John, which is the last Gospel that is written, right, we, we see a completely different dimension. We read the Gospel of John, and we, we see the Son of God, God in the flesh. And in the most magnificent glory, John presents the deity of Jesus Christ to us. And like, the, like, the, like all the other Gospels, John has a message for us. And that message is, Behold your God. That's what John is trying to tell, uh, trying to get across to each one of us. And, and, and we're going to see that as we go. He's going to see, we're going to see all the way through his gospel that we're going to see him say, saying, Behold your God. Now, John is primarily written to the church. He's written to believers. 
uh, and, uh, and, and you'll remember that we said the words of John uh, that he uses, you know, there's only like 600 vocabulary words that he uses in the Greek language. And so it's really simple. It's, it's, it's the vocabulary is simple, and that's why it's great for new believers. When someone comes to Christ, that's, that's a great book for them to read right off the bat because John always keeps it simple. He, he uses simple words to proclaim incredibly profound, transcendent truths. That is John's way. John is simple, but he's deep. His gospel is all-encompassing, and we're presented with Jesus Christ, the blessed Son of God, in every chapter. And so, John's pattern throughout the whole book is that he presents the eternal word of God, Jesus Christ, and his salvation, and then he presents what people did with him. Right? He some received, some some and some believed, and some rejected, and some ignored. That was his message all the way through his gospel. Then we talked about when it was written, and we know that it was written in Ephesus, and it was written near the end of the first century. And by that time, it was written by John, the apostle to the church. So, and by that time, John was a pretty old man. He was old. John was the last of all the apostles, and all the rest. We're gone by now. And only he remained with the knowledge and the experience and the apostleship to write this gospel. And so he did. John sat down with his pen in his hand and he wrote under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And you could be guaranteed that every word is the very word of God about Jesus Christ on these pages. And John gives us his purpose, just like all the rest of the Gospels give us their purpose. John gives us his purpose in, in chapter 20, verse 31. He says, but these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. John talks about Jesus because Jesus is the only hope for mankind. Amen? He is, He's, and, and he wants, John wants every single one of us to believe. John's message throughout this book is, is for us to behold Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and his salvation, and then he leaves it up to each one of us to decide if we are going to believe or reject Christ's offer of salvation. That's John's message throughout. And as you read this gospel, I want you to remember this. Remember, I kind of hammered this home. On every page you're going to come into an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ on John. When you read John, you're going, to, you're going to come face to face with the exalted, majestic Son of God, Jesus Christ. You're going to, it's, I guarantee you, it's going to happen. Now last week I gave you an outline of the prologue, which is the first 18 verses. That's his first message to the church, is in that prologue, right? So in these verses we see Jesus Christ in six ways, and I'm not going to go over all of them again. Last week we saw the first one, which was the eternal Christ, which is found in verses 1 through 3. Uh, and we'll continue there today. And then we saw the incarnate Christ, that's in verses 4 and 5. So those are the only two. That is Christ in a human body, incarnate, right? First we looked at the eternal Christ. Uh, the eternal Christ. The first three verses, John presents Christ's pre-existence. And he is, that he is from eternity past. And eternity. In verse 1 he says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This is one of those incredibly sweeping inspirational statements that surpasses any of our human thought. If you and I try to wrap our heads around this, it is really hard to wrap your heads around. In the, in the beginning past, when the heavens and the earth were created, the Word already existed. From all eternity, the Word existed. The Word always was. So John says, in the beginning was the Word. He was there. He was. He, would, he always was before everything started. And he uses simple language. It's so simple. It's a profound truth, and, it, and, it's, and it's unable to be understood. You know, honestly, you and I can't wrap our heads around this. And remember, I, I told you this last week. If you come to the Gospel of John with your own reasoning, your own intellect and your own reasoning, don't do it. Uh, because you come to the Gospel of John with your heart and with a heart of faith, right? You have to receive this by faith. 
Then we looked at, then we looked at, at, at why John called him the Word. Now, why, why, why did he say in the beginning was, in the, why didn't he say in the beginning was Christ? Why didn't he say that? Have you ever wondered that? You know, why did he use the word word, right? Well, it's interesting and it bears revisiting so for any of you who haven't heard this. They understood the concept because the word word, the Jews, they understood this terminology because they understood the word word meant something to a Jew. Uh, and in the Old Testament, it was the Word of God that had created the universe. And everything that God did that was directed toward man, anything that came from God and con contacted man, that was called the Word. So the Jew was quite familiar with this concept because all through the Old Testament, there was the reality of the Word interacting with man. Second, the Greeks also understood this terminology because they had their own concept of the word. They believed that God's mind and his will was existing somewhere in space floating around. Remember I talked about this last week? It's just out there, you know? Uh, giving, the man, the, giving mankind the ability to reason and act and respond intelligently uh, and have some sort of power, right? God's mind then was always moving around and it was always somewhere, but it was impersonal. In, in no way was it personal. It, it was just an instrument through which God made the world, right? Uh, but it was unknown and it was unknowable. Uh, so they gave it a name. They called it the Logos, okay? Which means the Word. You starting to put these two together, right? The Logos is the Greek philosophical term that expresses the identity of this power of God that makes things do what they do and, and, and create and think and reason. This is the Logos, right? So when John says, in the beginning was the Logos, or in the beginning was the Word, the Greeks, to the Greeks he's saying, you, call, you talk about this unknown power of God, this mind of God, this reason of God, and all this stuff floating around? Well, here he is, and he's in a body. It's Jesus Christ, and he's saying to the Greeks, Jesus is the answer for your every problem. Every, every he's, he's what you're looking for. He's not unknown. And then he says to the Jews that Jesus Christ is the embodiment of all that God was, was for you in the Old Testament. And, and that's what John says a little bit later in verse 14. If you look at verse 14, the Logos became what? It says, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory, glory as the only Son of God, or only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Jew who reads this, they'd understand it. And the Greek reading this, he'd understand it. And with one simple concept, this logos, one simple concept. This is just so cool, right? John effectively reached the whole world with the gospel in one word. He is the embodiment of all God's power. In the beginning was the word. And then we look next. Okay, he, he progressed from that. He jumped up one more step. He says, okay, and the word, word wasn't only just there. The word was with God. And, and in the Greek terminology, the way that this is constructed, if you go back to the original Greek in this, you'll find out that this means the word was face to face with God. Now, and the word that's used there, the, the verb that is actually used there, it, in the Greek language, it, it, you know, and, and that, that idea of being with I identified the most intimate and per personal possible relationship of, in communion and, and in, in communication and in fellowship between two people, right? You take that, that idea of with and it's the closest relationship. And Jesus had that intimate, divine, face-to-face -face fellowship and communion with God in eternity past. And that's what John is telling us. But you know what? He gave it all up. Every bit of it. Paul, Philippians 2, Paul said that Jesus, though he was in the form of God, he didn't count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. That got to me last week. It still gets to me. 
The Word was with God, and He loved being there. It was glory to Him to be with His Father. He, he had an infinite, intimate fellowship throughout all of eternity, but He condescended, He humbled Himself, and He gave that all up for you, and He gave it up for me. And then look what John takes another giant step in this, in just in this one verse. He, he takes the final step. What does he say? First he said, in the beginning was the, the Word was there. In the beginning the Word was with God. And then here comes that, that quantum leap. In the beginning the Word was God. The Word literally was God. Jesus Christ is God in the body and nothing less. He is God in a body, the full mysterious deity of Christ, exemplified in humanity, and an unbelievable condescension to become like us. Uh, and, and so at the very beginning, John lays it down that Jesus Christ is the living word, and he alone is the perfect revelation of God. So why does it matter that we believe that Jesus is God? It matters because we can know the truth about God and what the Lord is like. And otherwise, you don't know what He's like. Apart from Christ, you and I can't know what God is really like and, and understand the doctrinal truths of the Bible. There's no way we can know that. To know Christ is to know the Father. There is no other. It is Christ and Christ alone. He is God in the body and God. And all that God is, is found in Christ. You know, Philip, one of the disciples, he lived with Jesus for three and a half years. And he still didn't get this, right? He didn't get this. He lived with him for three and a half years. So if you're having trouble understanding this, you're in good company with Philip. Philip said, on the night that Jesus was being betrayed, Philip said, Lord, show us the Father and it's enough for us. And, he, and so Jesus said to him, Have I been with you? Have I been so long with you, and yet you, you have not come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. And another time, uh, earlier, Jesus declared, I and the Father are one. There is no other. It is Christ and Christ alone. He is God in a body. What Jesus did for us is he opened a window of time that we might see the eternal, unchanging love of God Almighty. Isn't that wonderful? And, and Okay, so that was just verse 1. That was last week, right? Now, let me look at verse 2. I want you to know that this verse doesn't pre present anything new, but it's genius, right? Look at this. He was in the beginning with God. It's so simple, right? It's just restating, restating the, the profound realities of verse 1, right? It, 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 it's nothing else. And you'll notice that he said he was in the beginning. Remember, we've been talking about the Logos, this unknown thing out here. Now he's kind of drilling down. And so all the rest of this Gentile world and Jewish world is going to understand that this is in a person. This is in a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. So he says, he, he, and that's the way the Bible does it, amen? I mean, when you read the Bible, that's the way it does it. John puts these incredible concepts into simple words so that, so that even though our minds can't fully understand them, and I've, I've been to seminary, lots of years of education, and I don't understand them. Uh, even though we can't understand them, our faith can grasp them, right? We can grab a hold of it. And, 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 and know that he's God. He has always been God. And listen to this, it's important. Because he's God, to do anything less than accept him as God is blasphemy. Anything less. And there are religions and there's cults uh, and there are people who deny that Jesus Christ always was or that he is God and, and they blaspheme him. And, and you probably have had him come to your door. Right? I have. You know? Uh, and they come to your house and they tell you that he's just, he's, he's just a son of God. Or he's just one of many gods. Or, or you probably had people come to you and say, well, he's just, he's just a good man. He's just a good man. He was a good teacher. Right? 
He was, he was good. God just kind of... Here's, here's a popular belief in liberal circles, right? That God dumped the Logos, the Word, on him at his baptism. That's a really a popular theory. That he wasn't God from eternity past. Listen, all of that is just blasphemy. I want to show you how I know that that's blasphemy. If you look at 2 John 7, written by the same John... Now listen, John is dealing with this stuff back then. The same thing that he that we're dealing with today, he's dealing with it back then. And this is just the first century, right? So listen, listen to what he says in the second epistle. He says, For many deceivers have gone out into the world. Now watch this. Those who do not confess the coming of Jesus Christ in the flesh. See that? Those who, conf who do not confess. He's saying, in other words, that there are people who say that Christ isn't God in a body. And, he, and he's just one of many gods. That he really isn't God. Or like the current progressive line, that he's just a wonderful teacher. He's just a, just, you know, just a wonderful teacher, just a wonderful man. Gave us some good lessons to live by, right? That's, that's ridiculous. He's God. When anybody comes to you and says anything less than Christ is God, a very God from eternity past, and there's none other like him, then the end of verse 7, John says, such a one is a deceiver and the Antichrist. Such a one is a deceiver. Now drop down to verse 10. Now this kind of sounds harsh, but it's, there's, there's a good reason for this. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house or give him any greeting, for whoever greets him takes part in his wicked works. Now when we're talking about greeting him, we're talking about inviting them in. Come teach me what you want to teach me. That's the idea behind that, right? It's not just saying hi. You know, uh, I know that sounds harsh, but the, and it certainly doesn't mean that, that you don't go and try and share Christ with people who don't know him. Okay, I'm not saying that. Or people who are deceived. But it does mean that people who are preaching and teaching another gospel, you don't give them an audience. You don't, you don't say, I'm going to come to your church. You, know, just, you just don't do that. You, you don't worry, and don't worry about their salvation, because I guarantee you the Holy Spirit is going to work on them. If you talk to them a little bit about Christ, the Holy Spirit's going to work on them. And, and maybe uh, they will come to know the truth, and God knows this, right? And maybe he'll even use you to bring them. Who knows? But, but God's in control. Just don't open yourself up for the deception. So he says Christ is with God. He says he is God. And that's a tremendous truth because Christ coming to this world, uh, and because Christ coming to this world brought God to man, right? He came, he brought God to man. And John says, here he is right there in the form of Jesus Christ. He became a man. That's an incredible reality. He's telling the world that the painful search, your search for God, is all over because Jesus is here. Right? Then in verse 3, he tells us he, a little bit more about Jesus, his pre-existence in eternity. He says, the word is creator. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. You notice how that's two words? Anything? There's, there's, it's not like us putting it together and saying, oh, not anything, right? No, this anything is, is important. And, and again, it's a pretty simple statement, isn't it? It's not confusing. I think it's pretty easily understood. Now, I want you to notice that there's two statements of fact that are made here. One's a positive statement of fact. All things were made through him. All things. And then there's, an, there's the absolute statement of fact. And without him was not anything made that was made. Nothing. What does that mean? That means that Jesus made everything. Everything. Everything you see, he made. All things. The way that it's worded here in the Greek, it means every detail of creation. Every minute detail. Not creation in its total, but every single detail. Every element and everything, each being and each person, whether material or spiritual or angelic or human, has come into being by Jesus Christ. We read the same truth in Colossians 1. This is a magnificent passage. 
Paul says, For by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. You compare that to verse 3, all things were made through him and without him was not anything made that was made. And if you look, uh, it's the same incredible truth. And in the original language, those words were made mean that they, they came into being or became, became. Now, I want you to know what that's saying. Nothing was existing. No substance, no matter whatsoever. Matter is not eternal, you know. You know that matter, uh, everything that we see, this is not eternal. Uh, so, what he's saying, uh, I just, I just lost my train of thought. Uh, okay, so God didn't make something outside of himself. He didn't make anything outside of himself. He didn't, in Christ the Word took nothing but his own will and his own power, and he spoke the Word, and he created every single thing out of nothing, which is ex nihilo, right? Out of nothing. Christ was the one who created all things, one by one. Among the Godhead, we know him as the active agent creation, the person who made all things. Creation was his function and work, and we saw that again in Colossians 1. Now, we also find in Hebrews 1, 2, 1, 2 which is the scripture I almost ran to just a second ago, uh, it says, but in these last days, he's also, he has spoken to us by his son, whom he appointed the heir of all things. Now note this, through whom also he created the world. In the beginning, God created the world, right? God spoke it into existence, and he spoke it to Jesus, and Jesus did the job. Listen, it's all his. He owns every single bit of this world. All the universe, it all belongs to him. Jesus Christ made it all, and all things came into being by his hand. And there's nothing that exists that he didn't make. You see, he made everything. Everything came into being by the divine word of God, and Christ is that word in a body, and we believe that the Bible teaches that Jesus Christ created the world out of nothing. On a side note, I want you to know that John is, is countering the teachings of a group of people called the Gnostics because these Gnostics were heretics and they believed, they believed that, that God didn't create the world because they believed the world was evil. Well, they were right. The world is evil. Uh, but John says, no, listen, Jesus made it all, every little bit of it. Just because it's, it's corrupted by sin isn't Jesus' fault. Listen, if you don't think that Jesus, Jesus owns this whole world, just drop over to Revelation 10 this afternoon and take a look at how he's going to take it all back. It's all his. It's all his. Uh, and you know what? He's going to take it all back. I don't think that's too far away in the future. Be honest with you, I just don't. I think our time is short. Just watching the timetables. This is Christ's world. He made it. It belongs to Him. And you know something fantastic in salvation? He's He's really uh, He's winning it back. What he, What He What He put together in the very beginning. In fact, when He comes again, and, and you know the whole world, Romans eight says the whole world is groaning, groaning, waiting for redemption. Waiting for him to come back. For we know that this whole world, uh, through this whole creation, has been groaning together in pains of childbirth until now. Okay, anybody agree with me that this world's a mess? Amen. <laughs> it is. The whole world is in a constant struggle. It's groaning, and someday Jesus is going to come back, not only to redeem mankind, but to redeem the created world. Nature is corrupted by the stain of sin, but Jesus redeems the whole world because it's all his and everything is going to change. Now, go back and look at, look at some of the millennium and the, the other messages I gave on that. I'll tell you what, it's going to change and it's going to be good. So, we have seen Christ as John introduced him in his eternity, the eternal Christ. It's a tremendous truth 
He always was, and that talked about his pre-existence. And then he goes on, and we're going to look at the second, second category, is the incarnate Christ. We see the incarnate Christ. We see him as he, as he come, becomes a body to indwell our world. Look with me at verse 4 and 5. These two verses express the purpose of his incarnation. In him was life, and the life was the light of man. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. In other words, this pictures Jesus, the embodiment of life and light coming into the world and how the darkness reacted to it. John is talking about his incarnation here, his coming to the world. In these verses, John reveals two things to us, that Christ is the life of God and that he is the light of God. And I want you to see these. In the first one, in him was life. That's what verse 4 says. If, and if you look back at verse 3, if he created everything and everything out of nothing, right, uh, then certainly life had to be in him to create life, right? And after, after he made everything that's alive, in him was life. He is the, then the source of all life. Listen, Jesus Christ is the source of life from the tiniest little ant to the mightiest archangel. But John's particular message isn't so much concerned with physical life as he is with spiritual life. And that's what he's really talking about. And we know that because the, the word that he uses for life is zoe which is a Greek word for spiritual life. The word bios, bios is where we get our word biology from, right? And that de deals with physical life. But he uses the word zoe, which is, is, is spiritual life. Jesus Christ is the source of spiritual life. He is, he, you, you know, you, you may say, well, what do you mean by spiritual life? What, what, what is spiritual life? Well, let me, let me define it this way. It's easier sometimes to define something, what something is, by what it is not. Let's talk about spiritual death. What is spiritual death? And you'll understand spiritual life. Paul says in Ephesians 2, 1, that an unsaved person is dead in sin. It says, and you were dead in trespasses and sins. Every single one of us, we have been dead in our trespasses and sins. When you were born, you were dead in trespasses and sins. If you come to Christ, you're no longer dead. Spiritual death means that you can't respond to God. It's like a corpse. You have a corpse laying on a slab. You can take a knife and you can stab that corpse, that corpse and nothing's going to happen. Nothing. A person who doesn't know God, you can stab them with the spiritual truth and there is no response. They are spiritually dead. And, 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 and what's the one thing that a spiritually dead person needs? He needs life, right? So when Christ comes, he is the enabler to give them life. He says he's drawing all people to himself, right? That's why John talks about life so much in his gospel. And what is life? Life is the quality and the essence and the energy and the power and the force and the principle of being. That's life. So just look around. I don't, I don't think I need to tell you that our world is full of spiritually dead people. And people who do not know Jesus Christ are just existing in death. And Christ came to give them life. And that's the message we have. After all, they're not going to get it anywhere else, are they? Can you think of anywhere else they're going to? You know, the only thing that ever made a dead man come alive was Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ is life. He is the very quality of life, the essence of life, the energy of life, the power of life, the force of life, the very principle of life. Without Christ, there would be no life whatsoever. Life is in him and within his very being. All things exist and have their, their being, their life in him. And life is purpose, it's meaning, it's significance, significance of being. Christ is life. He is, he is the very purpose and meaning of life. 
Whatever the whatever the whatever life is and all that life is, it is Jesus Christ. It is all in Him. He is the source of life. He is the way of life. He is the truth of life. He is the very substance of life. It, it's it's very being and energy. Can I get an amen? amen. <laughs> I mean, so that's why John says he talks about life 54 times in this short gospel. That's why Christ came. Why did he come? John 10, 10, he says, I've come that you might have life and that you might have it more abundantly. Uh, in John 5, he said, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have what? Life. In John 14, 6, Jesus said, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And in 1 John, John says, Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. That's pretty simple to understand, isn't it? He is, the, he is life for spiritually dead people. Dead, dead, dead in their sin. Because we're all dead in our sin until He brings us to life. We're insensitive to God. We're existing in deadness. But Christ comes along and he can breathe life, spiritual life, into us. When, and, and when we come to him and give our life to Christ, then we come alive. Then, then he says, in him was life. And then he brought it, that life into the world. And the next part of the verse says, and the life was the light of men. Jesus brought that life into this world. And you know what? It was just like a light. It was just like a light. You take a light, you know, by itself, and the rays from that come from, that come from it, it, it just it shines and, and it, it brings it out. John says, Christ came with that life, and the life was like a light. A light emanates from its source. So, so did the life emanate from its source, Jesus. And Jesus came into this world as the light of life. He uses this term, light illustrates life. It's not something different that he's talking about. It's the same thing that's illustrated. Just like light, light emits from its source, so, so life is emitted from Christ. And his life is the light of mankind. So Christ came in, and that life was like a light. It just spread all over the place to light men's paths. There, you know, I, I can't help it, but there's, there's probably going to be somebody watching here online, or maybe even somebody here today who's, who's saying, uh, how can I have that kind of life? The, the, that, that, that life, that light in the dark, in a dark world, it's simple. Uh, I told you, John is simple. John says you come to him by believing. You, you, you say, well, what does it mean to believe? Did you know that 70 times in this gospel, John talks about believing? You say, what do, what do I have to believe? Again, John makes it very simple. First, you have to believe. That means that you have to be convinced in your heart and in your mind that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that he died for your sin on the cross, and that he rose, on the, rose from the grave to give you eternal life. And secondly, you just need to receive that. You, it means that you trust with your heart that everything that he said is true. And then you repent and confess your sin and ask him to forgive you and commit your life to all those things. And you, you commit your life to him. That's simply believing. It's not hard. It's ABCs, right? Admit, believe, confess. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness. One confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. It's not just intellectually saying, oh, I believe Jesus lived. Yeah, I believe, I believe, you know, that he lived. Uh, you know, it's not intellectually saying, I believe that even maybe what he said was, was okay, you know. Uh, it's, it's to do that, to believe what he said. It's to believe that he is who he is. And, and, and. And then to commit your life to him. And when you do that, you're going to stop existing in death and start living life with a capital L. Amen. And that, and it's not only spiritual life here and now, but it's also that it has eternal qualities. And all of you who belong to Jesus, uh, you're living 
eternal life right now. Did you know that? It's not something you're waiting for. Eternal life is not is not the length of life, or the or it's it's a quality of life, and it's just as eternal as it ever has been, as it ever will be. And this life was the light of man. The character of light is to shine forth, and the life of Jesus Christ just came out of him. And 21 times in the Gospel of John. He says, Christ is the light. But it's a sad thing, because people love darkness. He says, and this is the judgment. Jesus said this, and this is the judgment. The light has come into the world, and the people love the darkness rather than the light, because their works were evil. Christ comes with life that shines like light, but people love the darkness. What a sad thing that is. When you think about all that Jesus gave up to bring you life, to bring me life, and the light of God, only to have people say no to him. But they do. And they do all the time. Look at verse 9. He is the true light, is what it's, verse 9, if you drop down to verse 9, he's the true light, he is the only light, he's the life, the only life. Without Christ, men are groping around in the darkness, but when Jesus comes into a life, the days of doubt and uncertainty are behind, they're gone, and the path of darkness becomes light, and the way becomes clear throughout all eternity. Jesus Christ is the life and the light. He is the light in the dark world, and he's life to a dead soul. Now, I just really love this last verse. This is the last verse for today. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Okay, again, let me get some agreement. We live in a dark world, amen? Okay, and it's getting darker and darker every day, right? Right is wrong, wrong is right. I mean, it's just crazy, craziness on steroids. Uh, the prince of darkness rules this world, you know, right now. Uh, but And who is that prince of darkness? And we know him as Satan, right? And the demons of darkness are his cohorts. And because men love the darkness, they are just embracing it. Uh, they eat it up because their deeds are evil. Amen? And the light comes into the world and shines in the middle of all this darkness. And every place where there is the life of Jesus Christ, whether it was when Christ was here on earth, uh, when he was here, or whether it's in you, in your neighborhood or in your workplace, uh, that light is shining in the darkness. But most of this refers to Christ. He came into the world and there was the light. And you know, the darkness tried everything it could, and it couldn't put it out, couldn't get rid of that light. It just didn't, didn't have it. Satan took Jesus. Remember on the temptation? He took him out in the wilderness, and temptation tried to derail him from that cross. Satan attacked him on every side, and Satan tried every possible way to turn that light out. But did he do it? No. No, you know what? Uh, that's what the end of verse 5 said. And the darkness has not overcome it. It says, the darkness couldn't put it out. Jesus Christ is that light in, in the darkness. And the darkness, it'll try and try and try and try. All the way to the end. Yeah, I've read the book. And all the way to the end, it, the darkness is going to try. But the darkness of hell can't turn that light out. Amen? And thank God, one of these days, and I believe that isn't very far from now, Jesus Christ, the light of the world, is going to come stepping out of glory and say, I'm back. Amen? But even now, that light is shining brightly. Not only in this room, but in your lives. Right? That light is shining brightly in the lives of you, and Satan hates that. You need to know that. And he fights against it, but he can't turn it out. No. No. Christ is still here giving life. He's giving light. He came into the world as the light. He who was from eternity past came, came into time to give men life and light for their souls. Well, that's the first five verses. 
That's just the first five verses. I hope and pray that you already belong to Jesus. I hope you do. I pray that the light and the life of Jesus and, and Jesus Christ is a reality to you. And I trust that the light of God and the person of Jesus Christ um, has lit your heart for all eternity. I hope you're. I hope we're all lit. Amen. Uh, but if you've never surrendered your life to Christ, you're in the right place. I got to tell you, today's your day. Man, you didn't get here by accident. I'm going to give you a chance to, to make a decision for Christ today uh, during the invitation. And if you need to, take a step of faith. Step out and come to the back. I'll be waiting in the back as we sing this song. Jesus Christ is the eternal God. Jesus Christ is the inc incarnate God in a body. He is light. He is life. There is no question about that. The only question is, is what are you going to do with it? Amen? Amen? Biggest question you could ask yourself of all your life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just thank you for your word. And what incredible words in such a short period. Uh, of just, just five verses. You just gave us so many incredible truths. Lord, we just pray that you would. If there's someone here that needs you. If there's someone online that needs you. That you would draw them to yourself. That you would begin to illuminate their life so that they can come to know you as, as Savior and Lord. I pray that they would make that decision today. And, and Lord, I pray that if there's anyone else that needs prayer or needs any other kind of decision they need to make, if they need to come back to the Lord, whatever, whatever's, whatever you've got in their lives, I, I don't know what that is, you do. I pray, Lord, that they would, they would avail of, uh, themselves of coming back and, and, and during the invitation. And we just pray that you would get glory for everything that happens. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, as you heard, I always give an invitation, and so we're going to sing, uh, we're going to sing, But For Your Grace. It's a great song. Uh, so, we're going to sing, But For Your Grace. And as we sing that song, I'm going to be standing in the back. If you need to make a decision for Christ, you slip on out as we're, as we're singing. Amen? Would you stand with me?